Check out this show and other great shows live on your iPhone, Android, or BlackBerry at www.mobileradio.me. Is there a war coming in the Middle East? Are we headed toward a one-world government, a one-world religious system? Will America be attacked again? Do ancient prophetic texts warn of the time we are living in? Are we in the last days, the time of taking the trouble, the end of the world as we know it? And what are the increase of UFO sightings? Well, we may disagree as to what is causing the phenomena. We can't agree that it is real burgeoning and not going away. Is this the coming great deception that ancient prophecy warns us about? Does time seem to be accelerating? Join me, your intrepid host, L.A. Marzulli, as we explore these and other riveting and stimulating topics. This is Acceleration Radio. Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome. It's Acceleration Radio. I am L.A. Marzulli, and we're on the Fringe Radio Network. Hats off to producer Rick and the rest of the crew here. Um, it's been great. The last couple of weeks here, um, actually a couple of months on the uh, Fringe Radio Network. It's uh, my new home. We air every Thursday at 7.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So if you're listening, um, you are, well, let me put it this way. If you're listening on um, on MP3s or whatever, you know what, when, when it's actually aired live. A lot of people can't listen to it live, but you can always pick up on the MP3. But for those of you who are listening to live, you'll know that it's Thursday at 7.30. I want to jump right into it because we don't have a, time, a lot of time. We've only got an hour. I want to bring Nick Redford in. Uh, <laughs> my wife's sitting next to me. I'm trying to be good here, but it is, it's not going to work. Anyway, um, we're going to bring Nick Redford in. He's got a wonderful book out called Final Events. i got to tell you, folks, I'm on page 171, and I skipped to the ending. Pretty much covered the whole thing. The first, I would say, I don't know, 14, 15 chapters, 16, 17 chapters, it's, just, it's a well-written book. It's just a well-written book. If, if you're at all interested in the UFO phenomena, great book, great book. And um, my hat is off to him, and I will tell him so when we bring him on. But, you know, folks, um, the Middle East is not going away. Um, and just because it's not being covered in the news uh, this Thursday – it doesn't mean that nothing has changed or that the situation, let's say, has ameliorated itself. Because That's not what we're looking at. The place is volatile. Uh, last Friday was a, a, um, a day called Al-Quds Day. And, of course, I blogged about this. And Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, the president of Iran, spewing vitriol, spewing vitriol towards, the, uh, towards Israel, saying that Israel was a cancer. It must be eradicated. The, the Zionist place. And it's all this... It's, it's, I mean, it's absolutely crazy, the anti-Semitism. And by the way, folks, I closed the comments section on the blog because of the trolls that were there, steering the conversation, the blatant anti-Semitism that was, that was erupting there. The, some guy came on and was blasting Calvary Chapel. It's like, well, you know, you can say anything you want, pal, you know, but, I mean, where's your proof? You know, and, and what are you going to do, dig up something that happened 25 years ago? Meanwhile, Calvary Chapel's, are, you look, and I don't agree with their, all their doctrine. I'm not saying that. What's amazing is Calvary chapels, you know, hundreds of thousands of people have given their life to Christ because of Calvary chapels. And this guy's, you know, well, yeah, I tell you right now, yeah, Calvary chapel is sort of, you know, it's just, what did they do way back when with Maranatha music? Hmm. Come on, folks. I mean, you know, give me a break. Who amongst us is perfect? You know, I mean, let, why, don't we, why don't we go to this particular guy's? house and dig up all his stuff and see what he's doing behind closed doors. I mean, you know, it's just there's no zero grace and mercy here. Zero. And so all that on the blog got really annoying. Look, you know, I, I actually have a life and we're working on Watchers 5 and I, I'm, I'm working on my new book and, and all this other stuff. I mean, we get hundreds of emails every day. I can't answer them all. And the problem is when I'll answer an email, that person wants to become a pen pal. And they'll answer me back. So now even though I've got 1,489 unanswered emails, 
let's say I do 20 of them, and I go, wow, I'm really starting to catch up. No, you're not, because granted, out of that 20 that I answer, out of those 20 people, at least half of them will write again. So how do you deal with that? It just never ends. and It's just my wife and I. There is no intro. We have no staff. And so I apologize for not getting back to everybody. But when the comment section on the blog starts going 189 comments a day, and I do try to skim them all, I can't catch everything. And that's why I closed the comment section down. I will reopen it again. I'm not sure where, when, but I promise you I will open it at some time. Now, Rick, where is the chat room? Why am I not um, seeing the old chat room here? Yeah, see? What was that, Rick? Hello? Hmm. Were you Okay, hello. Is that it? Everything cool? We're not? Okay, good. All right. I want to read you guys something because I um, had a blog actually several weeks ago, and the title of the blog was, Is Israel Planning an EMP Attack on Iran? What's interesting is World Net Daily from Joseph Ferrer's G2 Bulletin, there was an article saying, echoing the very same sentiments. So I reposted that, and I'm going to read it to you because I think it's extremely pertinent. Is Israel planning e an EMP attack on Iran? Recently, there's been talk of the Israelis attacking Iran, or the U.S. attacking Iran, while Israel prosecutes a war with Hezbollah and Syria. Added to the saber rallying is what seems to be endless vitriol spewed by Iran's president, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. I believe that Iran poses an existential threat to Israel. And Dan Gordon, who came on the record in Watchers 3 and discussed this at length, also holds this position. Iran seems to be chopping at the bit to attack Israel. So much so that the Ayatollah Khomeini recently stated that Iran should prepare for war and people should start gathering three months supply of food and water. Where have I heard that before? The Iranians have threatened to close the Straits of Hormuz if they are attacked, a strategic move that I blogged about months before the Iranians announced their intentions, then followed by actual naval exercises in preparation for carrying out their threat. The Russians are countering U.S. sanctions and the threat of invasion by announcing that an attack against Tehran is an attack against Moscow. Strong words and ones that should be heeded. The saber rattling continues unabated. Over the weekend, World Net Daily ran a story about the use of an EMP, an electromagnetic pulse bomb, that would be deployed over the U.S. homeland. And there's a link on my blog to that. Here is a very possible scenario based on an Israeli electromagnetic pulse attack. And if it occurs, it would end the Iranian threat in a heartbeat. Israel has nuclear weapons. They also have a delivery system for those weapons. What if Israel were to deploy one nuclear weapon, launching it from the Persian Gulf and detonating it 200 plus miles above Iran? In other words, what if the Israelis use an EMP? Let me cough for a second. Iran would lose all of its infrastructure and in essence find themselves back in the 19th century before the Industrial Revolution. Chaos would ensue in Iran, and the mullahs might lose their hold on the country, as communications would be then non-existent. Iran's nuclear program would cease. Their power grid would be knocked out, telecommunications of every sort, a thing of the past, and little or no nuclear fallout. In short, the Iranian threat would be over in minutes with the deployment of one Israeli electromagnetic pulse weapon. In closing Kinney's post, my post is a scenario that may or may not happen. However, it is a viable position for the Israelis to take as it disables Iran quickly and without a long, protracted war. An EMP deployment on Iran will also send a strong message to other countries. An EMP over Iran? Nothing would surprise me at this point. There's the blog. Um, and i got to tell you, folks, um, from my perch, it seems like the perfect thing to do. You know, once again, i uh just telling you what I see. And, um, you know, we'll have to wait and see exactly what happens. Meanwhile, back in the United States here, the Mississippi River is drying up. That's right. The good old Mississippi seems to be drying up. Now, look, I'm, I'll be 62 years old in December. I've never heard of such a thing. I've gone back and looked at files. There have been many flooding of the Mississippi, but I can't find any information on droughts 
um, to the point where the Mississippi River stopped flowing. I'm sure it has happened before. But you see, when we take all this in conjunction with the earthquakes, with the famines that are happening, with the pestilence that is happening, with the fish and animal die-offs and the volcanic activity which is happening, I mean, is it really business as usual or something more? And that's what we need. That's what we need to understand, folks. In my opinion, we're looking at something more, definitely something more. The Mississippi begins to dry up. The barges can't come down the river. It's going to impact trade. It will impact uh, the commodities because you can't move goods up and down the Mississippi like you have for hundreds of years. Meanwhile, the drought is definitely and will affect the commodities. By that, I mean, of course, food goods and, and what people trade in. Everything is based on petrol. Um, when, the, when the food begins to um, not ripen, okay, and uh, we see it with the price of corn. Corn's about to go through the roof. So what happens then is gas goes up because everyone knows that, gee, there's a drought. The corn won't, won't ripen. So now the next thing is it's like, well, that commodity, the, what we have, that commodity has to be shipped. So we're going to hike up those oil prices. And that's exactly what we see. Oil out here, I should say gas at the price out here, is well over $4 a gallon now. And I think it's going to climb uh, very, very soon. Anyway, folks, that's a little bit of the some of the um, uh, talking points, whatever you want to call them, that are that are sort of on my mind. Again, I really truly believe that uh, the place to watch is the Middle East and Israel. You know, we say this week after week. I've gone back. Someone wrote me and talked about LA. This is all you ever talk about is you know doom and gloom and blah blah blah. I've been saying this for four years. I get it. I get it. But as a watchman, and as someone who excuses a biblical worldview, who embraces a biblical worldview based on the prophetic messages that are in the Bible, how can I do anything else? I'm not going to make up stuff, and I'm not going to sensationalize, sensationalize uh, subjects. I won't do that. What I try to do is report what I see in light of biblical prophecy and how, you know, how that affects or may affect in the future every person on this planet. Look, folks, something is coming. I keep banging that drum, and I keep, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not letting go of that. We know war is coming, World War III in the Middle East. It's coming. If this thing gets diffused, hallelujah, amazing. But I don't, I don't see that. Syria is certainly not, not uh, you know, Syria's a powder keg. It's, it's an all-out civil war. So I, I think it's safe to say that what the prophecies that were written in the Bible thousands of years ago are coming to light in the modern era. So that's pretty much all I've got to say about that tonight, folks. I'm going to kind of cut this short. Let me go back to my blog here on the on the internet because what I want to do is I want to bring our guest in Nick Redfern. We've got a ton of material to cover. And there are some questions already in the chat room. Or not the chat room, but in, in my email. So uh, let's do this. I'm going to take a quick break and I'll come back and we'll bring in Nick Redford. And at the top of the hour um, uh, we'll start taking calls maybe 10 minutes after and uh, we'll go from there. But there's a lot of ground to cover. We'll see if we have time for the calls. I'll give that number and let you know when it's okay to call. You're listening to Acceleration Radio. I am your intrepid host, L.A. Marzulli, and we'll be back on the other side of the break. Thanks for keeping it here, folks. Are you concerned about your financial future? Banks are failing, stock prices declining, and the government just keeps printing money. Eventually, our dollar will have little more value than monopoly money. Limit your exposure to the declining value of the U.S. dollar. Purchase gold and silver coins and bullion, which, by the way, has never gone to zero in value and is resurging. Eagle European Capital is your trusted source for gold and silver coins and bullion. A company based on Christian principles, Eagle European Capital strives to provide expert advice on which metals to meet your financial needs. They also offer free resources to help you become a prudent person who foresees danger and takes precautions. Visit our website at www.eagleeuropeancapital.com or call for your free consultation, one 623 1239 You don't have to fear the future. 
face it prepared. Call one 623 1239 today. You're listening to the Fringe Radio Network right here at FringeRadioNetwork.com. If you would like to sponsor a program or advertise on our website, please contact us. Join the Fringe Radio Network on Facebook and subscribe to our programs on iTunes and tell your friends about us. We're so glad you've joined the Fringe. And now, back to the show. Radio folks, I'm your interpret host, Kyle A. Zuli. I just want to um, thank in advance Nick Redford for uh, coming on the um, on the show tonight. He's written, Nick's a, a prolific author, he's written several books, but the one we want to talk and, and focus on tonight is, is the latest book, I believe, called Final Events. Let me just give you an overview. Nick Redford works full-time as an author, lecturer, and journalist. Let me bounce this up a little bit. Give me a second. I'll start that again. Nick Redfern works full-time as an author, lecturer, and journalist. He writes regularly for UFO Magazine, Fate, 40 and Times, and Paranormal Magazine. His previous books include There's Something in the Woods, On the Trail of the Saucer Spies, and Science Fiction Secrets. Nick's, Nick has appeared on numerous television shows, including BBC's Out of This World, the History Channel's Monster Quest, and UFO Hunters, the National Geographic Channel's Paranatural, and the Sci-Fi Channel's Prove positive. Nick Redford lives in Arlington, Texas, and can be contacted, for those of you who might wish to shoot him an email, nickredford.com. Um, the book I want to talk about tonight, and I'm, I'm excited about this, is the book that we just talked about, Final Events. Um, I have read it. Uh, it's a great read, lots of information. Nick, uh, my, my first question to you is right from the get-go. You talk about a connection and I don't know how to pronounce this gentleman's name. B O E C H E. Boche is um, is that close? Oh, Boche, Ray Boche. Ray Boche. Yeah, Boche. Yeah. Boche. Tell us the connection there and how it led to where it led yeah. to. I don't want to tip that you know that that name yet, but sure. Where, go ahead. Yeah, I mean this is probably the strangest book I've ever written. Final events and. Um, it basically deals with like a think tank type group in the government that investigated the UFO subject for a number of years. And of course, you know, government agencies over the years or the decades, there have been a lot of investigations by the Air Force, like Project Blue Book, Project Grudge, Project Sign. The CIA had its own project. And this was like another one, like a think tank type group that looked at the UFO phenomenon and came away thinking that, or concluding that it had nothing actually to do with aliens at all. And they put more like a, an occult, paranormal, demonic spin on it. You know, they thought it was something literally kind of, you know, supernatural rather than extraterrestrial. And the reason why I got kind of on this story was that a few years ago, I interviewed a man named Ray Boche, who lives in Lincoln, Nebraska, and Ray um, is a former state director for the Mutual UFO Network, MUFON. But as well as that, he's also an Anglican priest. And he was approached by a couple of guys from this particular think tank group in the early 1990s who wanted to discuss with him their views on the UFO subject. And they, they kind of selected Ray, I think, because, you know, he had a background in sort of, you know, Christian religion, etc. And they wanted to basically explained to him that there was this group in government that they were working with that had sort of deeply looked into the UFO subject and, as I said, came away thinking it had sort of literal kind of, you know, like demonic origins rather than extraterrestrial. And I actually wasn't looking at this story or even for it because I didn't even know it existed. You know, I was actually speaking to Ray about a completely different matter and he happened to mention it and I thought, well, that sounds really interesting and he gave me a few sort of pointers and leads and told me the whole story of how, you know, he was contacted and what they said. And that sort of allowed me to open a few more doors and then to dig further into the story and sort of really get to the bottom of this group and, you know, what it found and what it believed and why it came to these particular conclusions. Fascinating. Now, this led you to, um, from, from talking to Ray Boucher, and then mm -hmm. you talk, led you to, a group of people who call themselves the elite. Tell us who these people may be and what your initial contact was with the gentleman from the Collins elite. 
Yeah, I mean, the Collins Elite, it's basically kind of a nickname. I'm not entirely sure I ever got the... Re well, I don't think I ever got the real name. It's kind of like with the CIA, you know, the Central Intelligence Agency. Although that's its official name, it has a nickname of the company. You know, but there isn't actually a group in government called the company. You know, it's, it's the CIA, and that's its nickname. And I think, from what I gathered, the Collins Elite was sort of like an in-house nickname for this group, where I think the real name is probably still classified and government agencies often do that you'll know they'll create a project and it'll have an, an unofficial nickname which people use in case the story gets out you know and it doesn't compromise the, the classified name um, but basically what happened was through these sort of leads and information that, that Ray gave me I was able to sort of speak to not a lot of group members you know I wish you know in a, in a best case scenario I would have been able to speak to sort of 20 30 members however many were in the group which was never sort of really made clear but overall you know I, I managed to at least speak to a handful of them and this was sort of under very weird and sort of almost like clandestine circumstances you know where we'd sort of have a meeting at a restaurant or something like that you know it's kind of literally you know be at this restaurant at noon or whatever on you know August the 10th or whatever date and the the people I spoke to uh, as I said about six or seven altogether from this group I was able to verify certainly their background you know within the military and the various official agencies etc um, and they sort of range literally in age from like 80 to 40 or 40 to 80 I should say and obviously the older guys were ones who were retired the younger ones who were ones who sort of come along but even the older guys seemed to still be involved in sort of a consultancy basis and they told me how you know they'd sort of gone back to the early years of the whole ufo subject and found that you know people a lot of the people who were or the early researchers into ufos were also dabbling deeply into things like ouija boards and demonology and um you know things like this and um they took a lot of time researching a man named Jack Parsons. Jack Parsons was a rocket scientist who actually created the Jet Propulsion Laboratory out in Pasadena, California. And he was a brilliant rocket expert who had a top secret clearance with the military. But he was also someone heavily into UFOs and the occult. He was sort of like a disciple of Aleister Crowley. And uh, before every rocket launch, he used to invoke the god Pan to try and uh, have a successful rocket launch. And he believed that he, through these sort of various um, sort of meditations and rit ancient rituals, he believed that he opened sort of like a portal or doorway to let these the modern day era of UFOs through. But he Parsons came to believe again it was like some sort of demonic doorway rather than a doorway to the stars. And this group, going right back to the 40s, apparently had sort of focused on all these different issues, and you know, pretty much right through to the present day, if you like, sort of 50 years worth of research. Wow. Uh, yeah, Rick, um, we do want callers, but let's, let's wait a little bit and we'll, we'll bring them in in a bit. Okay. Um, Nick, let's, let's talk about, because this is, this is very, um, you know, my research, I've written six books on the Nephilim and on how it ties into the UFO thing. And um, I don't know your belief system or your worldview, but when I read your book, I mean, this is everything, that um, this this is in my backyard. Let's put it that. Way. I mean, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, I mean, I, I wrote it. I mean, you know, I'll be the first to admit I don't have any hard and fast beliefs because I try not to get caught up in belief systems. You know, I prefer to deal with evidence. You know, that that's not to you know cast doubt on anything. It just means I'm the sort of person who, you know, it's not enough for me to you know, to believe that the sun's going to, you know, come up tomorrow morning. I need to see the scientific evidence to demonstrate why it is, you know, that kind of thing. I, you know, I, I, have, I have difficulty in believing things without seeing evidence it exists, you know. But that's not to say, as I said, not to denigrate anything. That's, you know, why I wrote the book and why I didn't write it from the perspective of being critical or supportive. You know, the, the point of the book was, the reason I wrote the book was because I found it fascinating that there was a group in government that was being funded to look at the idea that UFOs had demonic origins. You know, it's, a, it's an amazing and intriguing story, you know, and it's not my place to, you know, criticize anybody's belief systems. You know, it's my place to report on and tell the story of what happened, you know, and, you know, I believe that's the, 
the responsible way of doing it is not for me to say, well, this just cannot be or can be. You know, I said, this is the data, you know, and make your own minds up. Um, so that was basically the approach. But, yeah, I mean, you know, you, when you look into a lot of the, the UFO phenomenon, you can find parallels with a lot of sort of supernatural type activity, you know, and um, there's absolutely no doubt about that. And, um, and and it also is a fact that many of the early sort of formative players in the UFO field were dabbling in the occult. I mean, for example, one of the people that this group, the Collins Elite, were interested in was a man named George Hunt Williamson. And back in the 50s, George Hunt Williamson claimed to have been in contact with aliens. Uh, but his contacts, he used to use a Ouija board. Now, this made the Collins Elite think that but they believed it. I mean, they believed fully that he was in contact with some sort of intelligent entities, but they believed he was being deceived by, you know, sort of like malignant demons, if you like. They, they, they believed that these messages were sort of like a demonic deception, that it was, they were telling him basically what he wanted to hear. And by, and by the way, you tell the story very well. I mean, I've, I've, re I've read the book all but about 20, 30 pages, and it's just no, fascinating. And well written, well researched. Let's go back to Jack Parsons. Mm. Parsons did a um, uh, a ritual uh, that mm. became the, the Babylon King. Uh, we mm. know that um, uh, from my other colleagues, specifically Russ Dizdar, who's delved into satanic ritual abuse, mm. uh, which is a you know hour show. Um, but they talk about. Um, the, some of these sub-personalities that come through these people call themselves Babylon working babies. And, of course, this goes back yeah. to the ritual. Tell us about what happened in that ritual and what do you think was the result of it? Well, yeah, well, basically, I mean, to sort of expand on Parsons, just a little bit, quick, a bit of quick background. You know, he was a disciple of Aleister Crowley, who himself, you know, was somebody who... I won't say devil, but I mean, you, because that's the wrong word. You know, he was heavily into the occult and he, you know, he was very well versed in altered states and, you know, sort of performing sort of long term rituals and rites to conjure up all these different entities. And one of the things that, um, that Crowley conjured up was this entity known as LAM, L A M, which if you see pictures of LAM or the specific picture that, Crowley drew, it looks just like a so-called alien grey, you know, this sort of large head and little tiny shoulders and penetrating eyes, etc. Um, and Jack Parsons gravitated towards the work of um, Crowley. And he was living out in, Cal in California, in Pasadena, and basically um, became not just a disciple, but, you know, part of um, Crowley's entire network and actually sort of started, ran like a subgroup out in Pasadena. Uh, which is where, he, as I said, he also set up the Jet Propulsion Lab, which is now, you know, a part of NASA. Um, so he was a brilliant rocket scientist, had a top-secret clearance with the military, but he was also someone who was heavily into the occult. And the military kind of turned a blind eye. They were like, well, you know, if he can build rockets... We don't care if he's dabbling in demonic activity, you know, on a Sunday afternoon or whatever when he's gone home, you know, as long as he gets the rockets flying. That was basically the approach. But he um, basically sort of engaged in this um, ritual, like a long, torturous ritual called the Babylon working. The idea was to sort of provoke or create like an elemental being, an elemental entity, um, you know, like a like a magical being, if you like, and um, you know the various sort of ways and means supposedly to do this, where you know you either conjure it up or you kind of open a portal or a doorway to some other realm of existence and sort of allow it through. And you know, this sort of beautiful girl came into Parsons' life, and he came to believe that you know this was sort of the you know the elemental brought to life, so to speak, or at least you know entered his life in some fashion. Um, but, you know, Parsons, you know, as I said, he was a, he was an unusual and an intriguing character, but, you know, like a lot of people, when you start dabbling into all this sort of occult stuff, you know, it's kind of like, be careful what you ask for. And when you open a lot of doorways and portals, the big problem is closing them again and, and getting rid of the things that you allow through. Um, 
And in Parsons' case, like a lot of people who get into some of these things, it all ended in big tragedy when he blew himself up, unfortunately, I mean, by accident, in his lab in 1952. And, you know, he just about survived the the journey to hospital. But, you know, working with explosives, you've got to be careful at the best of the times. But, you know, it was almost like he did kind of a Faustian pact, you know, and, and came off worse, as, as you inevitably do in that sort of situation. Uh. So, so Parsons does the ritual. We're not sure exactly what happens. No, no one's really. We have no witnesses to that. It's not on. Can't get a you know a Netflix video of a thing. But yeah. he does the ritual allegedly. And right after that, we start seeing a lot of UFO activity. Tell mm-hmm. us what happens next. Yeah. Well, basically, Parsons believed that you know he opened a doorway to some other realm of existence. You know that some people might call hell that some people other people might call you know like another realm of existence like a fourth or fifth dimension you know it's everybody's opinions differ but he basically believed through this ritually opened this door to allow the the flying saucers through and these supposed alien entities but parsons and then subsequently the collins elite studying parsons's work came to believe that what he actually allowed into our world were literal demons who we're going to sort of get their metaphorical claws into us by presenting themselves in like a fashion that would be the ultimate deception and that would be relevant to the people of our era, you know, that where we would fall for the ruse, that is to say, present themselves as friendly alien entities, where in actual fact, you know, they were sort of demons preparing the way for the sort of enslavement or destruction of the, <coughs> excuse me, of the human race. Um, and Parsons really did believe, you know, that, that he'd opened this doorway. And then, of course, the problem was, well, how do you close it? And he, his view, I guess, that he was arrogant enough to think that he could take these things on and enter some sort of pact with them. Um, but, you know, what's interesting is that, you know, this was 1947. And as I said, no sooner had he completed this ritual. And then we had the famous Kenneth Arnold Flying saucer sightings of a Washington state in June, which coined the term flying saucer. Then a couple of weeks after you had Roswell, then, you know, countless sightings all across, the, not just the U.S., but the world. Then, you know, the military got involved, panicky that, you know, is it the Russians or is it some, you know, secret weapon or whatever? And so, you know, all these little projects were set up to try and evaluate what was going on. But, you know, Parsons felt that he... He knew the full story, and um, you know, but he, he was of concern to the military, not because he was just some guy dabbling in the occult, but because he had a top secret clearance and was working on some of the military's most secretive rocket programs, you know, out in California. So. I've, I've also maintained that uh, the Foo Fighters seen over Germany at mm. the end of World War II was because of the same same type of portal was open. Mm-hmm. This was opened by. Um, the the death camps and the ritualistic mm-hmm. slaughter that brought about the Holocaust. Well, the word Holocaust mm-hmm. means an offering on, a, on a, a burnt offering on an altar. So it's it's very very. You know, there's a lot of similarities between these things. Mm-hmm. Stuff stuff was being opened. I mean, in my, in my opinion, it all goes back to the same force. It's incredibly luciferic or demonic. And it's funny you you mm-hmm. talk about something a, a phrase that I've coined called the coming great deception, and mm-hmm. it's. All my books, I mean, I talk about this coming great deception. You just, you know, talked about the demonic rules. Exactly. We're on the same page here. I mean, that's exactly what I think mm-hmm. these entities are. They're not from, you know, Zeta Reticuli or, or someplace yeah. else. They, and Jack Vallee, you, you, and I know you know this, you know, Jack Vallee, mm-hmm. yeah. of deception, basically is laying out um, the same type of, of scenario. Um, in the book, let me just go to a page here. I get this right. You, you, you quote a, a Reverend Robert Short on page 50. Yeah. Just, I found that extremely telling. Is this man alive today? Yeah, Bob Short. Yeah, he is. I, the last time I saw Bob was at a conference out in Landers, California, a giant a place called Giant Rock, um, about three years ago. And he's, you know, he's still as running around as you know, energetic as ever. He must be sort of mid-80s if not more than that, I think, now. So. Well, tell us your connection with him. And well, but, Yeah, sure. Well, basically, Bob Short was one of many people in the early 1950s who sprung up 
predominantly in the sort of California area, but not exclusively, who became, they became known as the contactees. Now, you know, I'm sure most people today who are aware of sort of alien abductions know of the term abductee. But back in the early 50s, the contactees were people who claimed sort of close encounters with very human-looking aliens. They were described as, as almost ironically, you know, like angelic-looking, you know, with sort of heads of long blonde hair, and they would meet in sort of desert locations and talk about sort of philosophical issues and why we needed to uh, disarm our nuclear weapons, etc. And um, many people sort of felt compelled, you know, even if they had no interest in UFOs before, they just felt compelled, you know, sitting at home watching TV one night to sort of drive out to the desert, waiting for something to come down that they didn't really know why they were even doing it. Um, but Bob Short was one of these who did that. You know, he felt compelled to actually go out to this place called Giant Rock and um, subsequently met up with a man named George Van Tassel who lived out there who'd also had his own experiences. And, um, you know, it was like an entire movement that was set up. And the, these so-called aliens became known as the Space Brothers. You know, had this more of like a cult, a cult, not occult, a cult-type, um, you know, scenario to it. Um, but again, what's interesting is that many of the experiences of, you know, these early contactees, like the ones I talk about in the book, their contacts, again, were, were undertaken, not by, you know, just always a metal ship coming down to land, but when they were in sort of trance-like states or occult, you know, doing rituals and rites, or like with George Hunt Williams sort of mentioned earlier, he was one of the, the early contactees. He used Ouija boards, you know, some of them... Um, ingested things like mescaline to get into an altered state. Um, some, you know, used LSD. Others put themselves into deep trance states, you know, where they could sort of self-hypnotize themselves. So in other words, you know, it was like there was this theme running through all these early contactees that, you know, the experiences didn't occur as you would expect if it was all just nuts and bolts flying saucers, you know. it was That, that kind of gives a clue that it was more more ethereal, if you like. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Interesting. From the contactees, and, and, and I'm, I'm familiar with what you're talking about, uh, you know, people had contact with so-called... Mm -hmm. And, and uh, in, in the book, you talk about that some of these beings said they were from Venus, uh, which yeah. is hard. You talk about, it, it's almost like they're, they're doing a, a play on words. Tell us about that. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the entire you know, the scenario of, you know, coming from another planet, so to speak, um, you know, is one of these situations where when we look back at the time frame, it, you know, it was sort of seen as plausible, you know, in terms of, well, maybe they were coming from Mars, maybe they were coming from Venus or even the moon. But, you know, the more we've sort of learned about astronomy and outer space today, you know, it's clearly that these places are sort of, you know, you couldn't live there if you tried, you know, the temperatures and the atmosphere. And more importantly, you know, you couldn't just, if you were able to adapt to that, well, then you wouldn't be able to live on our planet. You know, it's it's one of those, um, you know, sort of situations. And, um, you know, but Venus, you know, was one of the prime locations that many of these sort of alien entities claim to come from. And, of course, that sort of sounds, you know, like a like a deception, you know, in itself in many respects and um so so for that reason you know i think it's difficult or impossible to sort of trust the word of what these things were saying it was clearly done for effect i think and clearly done to sort of entice the contactees into their fold and then sort of spread the word further and further hmm. let me ask you something Nick. with everything that you've uncovered in all your research um do you think the Collins elite is the real deal? Do you think that, that somebody's kind of pulling a leg on this thing? Were you able to? Um, any... Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, there's no doubt that they exist because, you know, I met a number of the members and Ray, I wouldn't have got onto the story if Ray Boshe hadn't put me onto it. And, you know, he met two of the members. Um, Linda Malton Howe, she, who's written a number of books on UFOs, Linda had letter contact with some members of the group. You know, I had contacts since publication. A few other people have come forward talking about the group. So there's absolutely no doubt that the group exists or existed and came to these conclusions. You know, the big question is, 
you know, how does it fit into the, you know, the bigger picture? Did they get the full story? You know, were they right on part of it? Were they right on all of it? You know, is the interpretation of hell correct, you know, or is it should it be another dimension or like a portal to some other form of existence? You know, we, we just don't know. But I mean, there's absolutely no doubt at all that this group, you know, that initially, as far as I'm aware, the first sort of overture, if you like, or the first approach was made to Ray, Ray Boucher, back in 19, December 1991, excuse me, November 1991. That's the earliest I've been able to find that somebody from the group spoke to somebody in the UFO research community. So, you know, that's sort of 21 years ago, long before, you know, I was even on the story. So there's no doubt they exist. Um, you know, the big question is why have they made these sort of subtle approaches? And I think probably it's to sort of test the waters of public opinion and see what the response is when this story gets out there. Because there's absolutely no doubt that, true or not, this is without doubt the most controversial theory and disturbing theory, you know, for the UFO phenomenon that, you know, it's one thing to say aliens are secretly watching us. It's another thing to say the entire population of the planet is being set up to fall, you know, because of this deception. So, you know, the stakes are very high and maybe that's why, you know, they felt compelled to test the waters and, you know, publicly or clandestinely, if you like, reveal a few tidbits of data here and there. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I, I actually wrote a piece on the blog oh, a, a while back, at least over a year ago, and it was the idea that I, I postulated that there was an old guard left over mm -hmm. from Truman era, uh, a cabal of men and women perhaps, who were monitoring the whole UFO disclosure move and making sure that information was kept under the radar. I mean, they've got the kibosh on this thing. And I read your book, Collins Elite, and they almost fall out of my chair. I mean, it's like, wow. You know, what I assumed um, existed may, in fact, actually exist uh, mm -hmm. from research that you've done. Um, it's funny, you talk about these guys are in their 80s. That fits the scenario completely. And now a new younger generation is coming up. I think I think we're going to see some sort of disclosure, but you know you've got people. I'm not going to mention any names here that are totally gung ho in the disclosure aspect mm. of both phenomena. They're saying it's like you know these these are our space brothers. These are from you know is that a reticulum? Mm. It's like um, it's like whoa, wait a minute. Um, why? And, and you talk about this in your book. Um, the at the same time, these people are being abducted. Women are being abducted. They're watching cattle being mutilated, you know, several feet away or in the next mm -hmm. room. Talk about the abduction phenomena to us, the yeah. programs to exist, and how and what your feelings are on it. I mean, what you think about this? Well, I mean, I actually the Collins elite they came to an intriguing conclusion about abductions. You know, on the one hand, for the most part, you have two scenarios. You have people in the UFO field who believe. Alien abductions are literally being done by extraterrestrials, you know, to take eggs, DNA, sperm, etc., you know, to sort of save their alien species. You know, that's the sort of controversial, accepted scenario by much of ufology. Then on the other hand, you have the, the skeptics who say, oh, it's all just nightmares and bad dreams and sleep paralysis and all that sort of stuff. My personal view is actually very similar to the Collins elite in the sense that they came to believe that the abduction scenario was more visionary in the sense that, you know, they viewed the experience as real, that some the entities were interacting with abductees. But it was more like a, imagine like in the Matrix movies where you have like this dream world that we think is real, but it's actually like a created hologram to sort of, you know, where these machine-like entities interact with us. And I think... The, the Collins elite came to a conclusion, and I actually share this conclusion, that, the, that abductions do occur and something interacts with us, but it does so more in like within our minds, within our dreams, to where, but it's so real. They can literally almost like manipulate the dream state, so we think we're in like a, a real realm or even in a UFO, but maybe we actually don't leave the bedroom, but it's such a, it's such a convincing sort of mind image that it, it's done in such, to such effect that it makes a person think, you know, they really were taken on a UFO. And the Collins elite came to believe this was being done deliberately to sort of spread it like a meme, again, to reinforce the idea that 
you know, aliens were taking us. You know, you you sort of give you insert enough people into this dream like hologram, and suddenly, you know, thousands of people are talking about being abducted by aliens. So it kind of adds to this scenario. Now, personally, you know, I'll be the first to admit I'm not sure if it's you know, is it demons or is it interdimensional things? Is it some entities we don't understand from some parallel realm? But I do agree with the Collins elite that I think much of the abduction experience is visionary. Now, that's not to say, as I said, people are making it up or dreaming it. But I think these entities, whatever they are, can manipulate sort of the re reality of the human mind and pretty much expose us to whatever they want us to see, basically. And look, I, I concur with you. Um, and I've heard this before. Uh, my, my response to that, uh, for the most part, has to the aura can be both and. I think they're capable. Mm. Exactly. What I'm saying. I, I think they're capable of. Of you know, person's never left the room, and he's had this whole experience. But then again, um, in, in the work of Dr. Roger Lear, why I believe it's so critical, um, mm. these abductees actually have the implants in them. Mm. Now, you know, they're talking about um, you know being taken aboard the ship. I mean, the, the typical abduction scenario, which, which mm -hmm. you both. And most of our listeners of this show are, are are knowledgeable of it, but you know the whole idea of being taken against your will and and you're 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 floated through windows and doors or whatever, and you're wind up on a ship. Um, mm -hmm. Why that could be, uh, you know, like you talk about like um, not, not hypnosis, but like hypnosis, where the, they they have my total control of a person, mm -hmm. where the person thinks, you know, this is room. On the other hand, we know from the evidence that we're seeing specifically with the implants, that these things are not, they're just not normal. In fact, actually mm -hmm. for five, the video series that we're doing, we're sitting down with the, the metallurgist for Dr. Larger, Roger Lear's team and discuss this with him. They, they give out a radio signal, which seems to be or a signal of like 317 gigahertz. Is that a clock speed? Is it, you know, we're not sure exactly what it is. So I, I come from the, the standpoint it's not either or. It, it can certainly be both and which gives it more latitude because I think some of these things, some of these things are real, you know, I mean, some of these experiences that people are taken and, and they mm -hmm. go places and they're, they're really, look, I've seen two craft mm -hmm. and, and since, since I'm 60, I'll be 62 in December. One when I was around 12, 13, the other one about three or four years ago, my wife and I were riding in the car. So something is going on here. Something, you know, moves with impunity in, in mm -hmm. the sky all around the globe. Uh, it shows up on radar. And, you know, people have seen entities in broad daylight. So, again, I, I just, I just, you know, just kind of want to nail that down a little bit. Instead of, you know, either or, I just think it's both. But I'm, sure. I'm stuck with my opinion, and, you know, mm -hmm. I guess i can do it at this point. Let's take some calls. Uh, if you want to call in and have a question for Nick Redfern, and our guest tonight, 888-682-7688. That number again, 888-682-7688, or international callers, that one, then the error code 702-508-4900. Take your calls and questions for Nick Redford. In the meantime, I, of course, have more questions for Mr. Redford. Again, Nick, why don't you tell us um, how we can get the book? Uh, I would okay. definitely, five stars. I thought it was fantastic. Oh, well, thanks. Thorough. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the book's called Final Events, and it's published by a company called Anomalist Books which is anomalistbooks.com, A-N-O-M-A-L-I-S-T.com. Um, and it's available, you know, at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, places like that. So all good book-selling outlets should have it, and it's final events. Well, again, folks, well worth the... Um the uh, price of admission to get that. You'll find a very quick read loaded with material, um, and I would highly recommend the book. It, if, if you're interested in the subject, it's almost sort of a must-read. Um, you touched a little bit about the idea of fallen angels, and you go back to the Nephilim. Again, I've written six books on the Nephilim. It's, it's what what I talk about. We're actually going September 29th. A little plug here. Uh, Russ Dizdar, my colleague Richard Grun, Myself and Fritz Zimmerman will all be at the uh, Nephilim Mounds Conference, you know, in Newark, Ohio, Newark, Ohio, on September 28th, 29th, and 30th. So, if uh, that, all that information is on my blog site, website, so I'm not going to 
you know, belabor that point here, but, you know, we're talking about the Nephilim. You also discuss it, and, of course, you talk about the Genesis 6 account, and then you refer, or you also, in addition to that, link to the book of Enoch, the Enochian account, which is ex very similar to the book of Genesis, although it amplifies the text slightly, and we see that fallen angels are procreating. Um, I'm not sure whether you're aware of this prophecy or not, but there's a prophecy by Yeshua, Jesus, 2,000 years ago, who warns us that... His second coming will be like the days of Noah, which is really a key prophetic verse. And I just thought I'd throw that up, up for your, your comment because what differentiates the days of Noah from many other time in history is the presence of the fallen angels and having sex with the women, creating the hybrid Nephilim. So we see abduction phenomena. They're interested in creating something, some sort of a hybrid. Um, we'll be meeting with David Weberly. We've had him on the show before. With the oh, yeah, I know, David. Mm -hmm. And we think that the, the black-eyed kids mm. are hybrids. Speak to that for us. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting theory. You know, the I mean, this is one of the things about abductions that is actually quite sinister. You know, it's one thing where people talk about, oh, well, you know, they're taking eggs, DNA, etc., because you know, they're on an evolutionary decline, you know, and they need to sort of beef up their stock, so to speak. You know, that's that's sort of the conventional line that a lot of people in abduction research take. But when you sort of go past that and you're into the more of, you know, creating hybrids that kind of look like us and then you have things like David Jacobs' work, you know, The Threat, his book, which kind of talks about the next step where they could infiltrate us, you know, and pass walk amongst us and, you know, unless you were sort of really close to them and, you know, had a good look, you wouldn't notice that many differences, you know. And then, of course, the more interspecies, you know, dabbling there is, if you like, they look more and more like us. But, you know, inside they've got that mindset that they're they're not one of us, you know. And um, and the more you get that, you know, I mean, you're quite right with David's stuff. I mean, his, his Black Eyed um, Children books are really good. One. For me, it's sort of like the definitive look at the subject because he covers all the different theories and ideas. And, um, you know, again, it has that atmosphere of a growing, almost like, an, like a silent hidden army, you know, growing of, of these things all around the world you know, and sort of subtly infiltrating key and influ influential areas. And, of course, you know, that would sort of, I guess, tie in, you know, with these stories from the days of Noah where, you know, you had these sort of, you know, fallen angels and procreating and, you know, creating this sort of, you know, hidden class of entities, which actually, you know, is, is, is actually very similar to what people are talking about today, you know, with hybrids and stuff like that. So. Yeah, and I, I certainly concur. I think there's a definite relationship between them. We've got a question from Julie. Julie, thanks so much uh, for writing in tonight. She writes, hi, LA. Hope you are well. I am. Thank you. I was getting over a cold. Uh, and, she, and she writes, this is a question is for Nick. Nick, what measures do you take as a researcher to verify a person's experience, mm -hmm. the supernatural, to rule out hyper-spiritualism slash religion and psychosis? Um. Well, I think, you know, whenever you interview, I mean, first and foremost, you know, I always say to people, the most important people in this subject are the witnesses, because without the witnesses, you know, we've got nothing to work with. But I think, you know, the more interviews you do with people, you know, and I've been interviewing people for sort of 15, 16 years, 20 years, you know, you become a good judge of character. You know, you can sit opposite someone and tell pretty much immediately, you know, if they're sort of spinning you a line or if they're a fantasist or, the, you know, they've got a psychological problem or they're just a normal person who's had a, a very profound, weird experience. So, you know, first and foremost, I listen to the story, evaluate the person. And, and then also, one important thing to do, you know, is try and determine if the person has any sort of preconceived ideas or beliefs that might sort of, um, you know, influence their opinion as to what happened or what didn't happen you know i think that's an important factor in it you know also um you know i understand that people when they have these experiences want to find out more so they read a lot of books that can be helpful but also it can be a hindrance in terms of contaminating the witness if you like so because they've been exposed to so much afterwards that their minds filled not just with their own experience but you know the thoughts and ideas of others which can sort of impact as well so 
you know, I always try and hopefully, you know, get to a person who, you know, when they've had the experience, that they remain sort of untainted in terms of, you know, being influenced by this or that, and they can just relate it with the facts. Um, and, and, and that's sort of the approach I take. You know, I would take the, the same approach. You know, I work as a journalist primarily. And, you know, if I'm doing an investigative story on politics or something, you know, I'd follow that same investigative journalistic approach in this, you know, to sort of just try and get the hard facts and... Um, and do it that way. So I don't try and sort of rule anything in or out. I just listen to what the person has to say and then sort of take each case on its own merit, so to speak. Wonderful. We have Gary on the phone. Gary, thanks for uh, calling Acceleration Radio. You're on the line with uh, uh, Nick Redford. Do you have a question? Gary? Okay, going once. <laughs> I guess he's not on. Right? Struck out. Oh, well. Continue on, please. I will move on here. Let's uh, go figure. Live radio. Got him. Um, we're oh, down that to, happens. <laughs> we're down to about the five-minute mark. Um, Nick, what are you working on, and how has researching this book changed your paradigm, or has it changed your paradigm? Um, well, I wouldn't say it's changed it that much, because I'm actually... Other than when I was sort of like a young kid, I've never really been that overly convinced by the extraterrestrial theory. You know, I, I will be the first to admit, and, you know, I mean, I'm sure you prefer me to be honest. And, you know, and I am the first to admit that I'm not sure that I literally go along with the, you know, the full, the full-blown demonic angle. But where I do fully agree with the Collins elite is I don't believe the UFO phenomenon is extraterrestrial. I don't believe that at all. I believe it does come from some other realm that sort of coexists beside us. Now, whether that realm is like a literal hell or heaven, or if it is like another dimension or some realm that can be explained by, you know, quantum physics allowing for the extra existence of extra dimensions, I don't know. Um, and I'll be honest enough to admit I don't know. But I, I do believe it's not extraterrestrial, and I do believe it's something that sort of coexists in another realm rather than coming from one star system to another. I don't think that's going on at all. So, you know, that's sort of my view, that is that the, the phenomenon is deceptive and presents itself as extraterrestrial as a means to cloak its real origin. I'm just not fully sure what I think that origin is, but it's not this star or that star. Yeah. It, it's amazing, Nick. I mean, I, I've never met you, and I want to meet you someday, and uh, maybe get you in for Watcher Six or something. But uh, okay, you know, cool. We're, we're very close in in, in believing. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, we're very close in, sure. in our perception of what this phenomena really is. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's why I read your book. A lot, a lot of points of of contact and similarity. Um, oh, I've been asked to just give a quick uh, update. Uh, some of the listeners in the chat room want to know about Dr. Roger Lear. Uh, he is on, and we will we will be reviewing Dr. Roger Lear. I think someday next week um, uh, for Watchers Five, we'll be sitting down with his 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 key metallurgist, who's look at these implants, and we'll go from there. So I hope that answers that question. Um, you know, that's it. That's all the time we've got down. We're we're down like two minutes before the end of the show. Nick, thanks so much for coming on. Give us your website again, please, for those who might. Okay. Well, I've, I've actually got a couple. One, the, the main one I use now is nickredfernsbooks.blogspot.com or nickredfern14, F-O-R-T-E-A-N, dot blogspot.com. And uh, you can link to me at Facebook there. And, you know, if anybody's got any questions or information or wants any, anything answers, I'm always, you know, pleased to chat with people. I'm not one of these stuffy authors who says, oh, go away. You know, I'm an author. I'm always, no, I, you know, I'm always pleased to, you know, chat with people and hang out and, and whatever. So. Well, Nick, thanks so much for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. Um, All right. Well, thanks, Ellie. I'll be shooting those uh, questions to you for the monthly news magazine uh, right, tomorrow cool. at the latest. And um, looking forward to getting those answers. And we'd love to have you as a guest on Watcher 6. Thanks for well, coming on. Really appreciate it. Nick Redford, Thank everybody. You. That was a fun interview. And uh, next week we're going to bring in um, Doug Riggs. I'm sorry, what did I say, Doug Riggs? Wow, that was bizarre. Hmm. Hi, Doug. Uh, Russ Dizdar. 
I'm not sure how I got Doug Riggs out of Russ Desdar, whatever, and Richard Grund to talk about the September 29th conference, the Nephilim Mounts Conference, which is coming up. It's in Newark, Ohio. If you go to my blog site, there's a link that will take you right there. You can register. Uh, it's going to be a great conference, I think. We're also bringing in Fritz Zimmerman to talk about the mounds. Um, and don't forget to keep it here for Doug Hamp's show. He follows my show, and you, I'm sure Doug has an interesting lineup tonight. You might want to check that out. Um, you've been listening to Acceleration Radio, folks. I'm your intrepid host, L.A. Marzulli. The hour has flown by. Our guest tonight, Nick Redford. And I suggest, highly suggest, strongly suggest you pick up this book if you're at all interested in the UFO phenomena. That's all the time we have for. Thanks. Hats off to uh, everyone at Fringe Network and our producer, Rick. This is Acceleration Radio. I am your intrepid host, L.A. Marzulli. And remember, folks, we'll see you either in the air or on the air. Good night, everybody.